Record. Awesome, awesome. Okay, welcome. This is Jerry Feta here. Uh, we have a, a special guest, not really special guest. She's here every week, but we're going to have uh, her helping with the actual presentation today. But I'm here with uh, Bree Shaw. Um, Bree, if you want to just jump on and say a real quick hi to everyone. Oh, we can't hear you, Bree. We'll let we'll let Bree get her audio worked out here. Um, so basically, um, Bree is going to be helping us with the presentation today, and so she'll be going over some components on the sacred account, how it works. Um, Bree, is your audio up and running? Is it? Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. It had my microphone set up to speaker. <laughs> Hi, guys. Uh, I, great to be here, and I'm great. I'm really happy to see all of you. Can't wait to dive into this today. Awesome. So guys, um, we want to cover some ground rules, things we cover every single week with you um, that don't change from week to week. And the first one is, as you're getting into this, um, you have to remove the idea that finances are complicated, right? This is one of those things that, that you know, for the average person, it really gets pushed on them. You know, finances are hard. Finances are difficult. I can't tell you, I've been doing this for, for since I was 18, I'm turning 31 uh, this weekend. I've been doing this for over a decade. And that's the number one thing I hear from the average person is money is difficult. I never understand this stuff. You know, it's too hard for me, et cetera. And so the idea is that, you know, finances really are just math. And so everything we're going to cover today is basic math. Everything we're going we're gonna to cover today is, is things that you can learn and understand too. It's not complex. It's not complicated. It's not hard. It is just basic math, and the math just represents vocabulary. And so if I say words today that don't make sense to you, or Bree says any words today that don't make sense to you, first, we're both from Alaska. We're going to try not to use complicated words. We're not raised like that, right? Um, but if we go over anything that doesn't make sense, like stop us and let us know, because the words just represent the math. The math just represents the concept, okay? And the concept is where people get lost, right? Well, what's up, Christine? Good to see you. The concept is where people get lost, right? When I look at a concept, the concept is what I'm actually going to be doing, right? The concept is, is you know, what I need to do. Like the concept of driving a car is different than how does an engine work? You see what I'm saying? So we focus all of our energy on understanding how an engine works, but we don't actually know how to drive the car. We don't actually own a car. We're not going to be able to do it. And we can learn all about pistons and we can learn all about you know, exhaust and then we can learn about, you know, combustion and all this stuff in an engine, right? But at the end of the day, we're not trying to be mechanics, we're trying to be drivers. And so the concepts we're going to teach you today, we have to remove the idea that I can't learn about it. It's too hard. It's too complex because the reality is it's not, guys. Um, it's something that anyone can learn. And so, you know, as we're going through this, the other thing is what we call arrival syndrome. Arrival syndrome is thinking you know it all already. Okay, the only person I can't teach is the person who doesn't think they can learn or the person that doesn't think they need to know they can learn, right? If I know it all already, why would I learn anything? Okay, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to impinge a little bit right now with this is if you're not getting the results you want with your finances, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but there's something you don't know. That's just how life works. If I'm not getting a result, then there's something I don't know. And so I have to go learn. Otherwise, I'm never going to get that result. Okay. Similarly, you know, if I look at someone that's got better results than me, doesn't matter what area it's in, factually, they know something I don't know. You know, they're better than I am at that thing. And that comes from repetition and learning, right? So those are the two main things. And then the third thing is have a purpose for being here. I want you to think about your finances right now. Okay. Take a moment right now. And I want you to think about your finances. Okay. Do you have debt? Right? Are you trying to save more? Are you trying to invest? Are you trying to grow a business? Like, What's the number one thing you're focused on with your finances today? And I want you to consider that and I want you to think about that and have that top of mind today as me and Bree are teaching. Right, And, and that's really going to help you out tremendously. So the other final thing, guys, knowledge that we don't act on is not knowledge. It's actually consumption disguised as knowledge. If I don't act on information, I didn't actually learn anything. I might have gotten information. I might be able to regurgitate back. But guess what? So can a parrot. What's the difference between you and a parrot? A parrot can repeat shit, right? But can you actually do the things you're learning? And so what Bree and I are going to challenge you to do today is to act. Okay, action takes courage. Action takes commitment. Action takes serious on, on, on my goals and my targets. I'm actually going to do something. And so our call to action today 
we have a couple of different things for you. So first off, everyone that's on today, um, we're going to give you a free ticket to the arena boot camp. Okay. So Martin Taylor, he's on staff with us. He's in the comments with us. Um, Martin, if you could just take note of everyone's name that's on today, we're going to give everyone that showed up a free boot camp ticket uh, for the arena boot camp on June 3rd. So that's our reward for having you guys here today. Um, you think enough of yourselves to invest time on your weekend on your Saturday. Now, if you've already got a ticket, then what I want you to do is to, I want you to take the extra one. This week, I want you to have a conversation with someone in your life who matters to you. You want to see them doing well financially. You want to see them succeeding. And I want you to give them the ticket. And I want you to bring them with you to the boot camp on, on Saturday, June 3rd. Okay. So anyone that's on today is going to get a boot camp ticket. And that's the first reward. But the second one is, is Bree and I are going to challenge you to do one of two things today. Number one is if you don't yet have a copy of my book, Blueprint to Financial Freedom, and I'll go ahead and share this with you guys. Um, so you can, you can see this, um, we're big on education. And so, um, so the first thing actually is the boot camp. Let me just show you guys the boot camp. So this is the in the arena boot camp. This is where you guys are all going to get the free ticket to today for attending. Uh, this is June 3rd, 1 to 7 PM. Um, these are six of my closest, uh, business allies. And I'll, I'll introduce just everyone for a brief minute. Chris Brown, he's the CEO of a company called tax hive. Okay. Chris is a close friend of mine. Uh, his business partner is Kevin O'Leary. Okay, you're probably familiar with Kevin O'Leary from uh, the TV show Shark Tank, right? And so Chris is partners with Kevin O'Leary and his tax firm. And Chris is going to talk about how he built a $100 million sales team, how he got a partnership with Kevin O'Leary. Um, the other person up here, this is Brenna Fox. I've known Brenna since I was probably 18 or 19 years old. She's from Alaska as well. She grew up in, in an area called Toke, which is literally a gas station um, out in the middle of nowhere. And so she went from there to now having, you know, an online fitness business. She's a, a legionnaire with First Form Nutrition. She's one of their top in the country. Um, and she's going to talk about how to be an entrepreneur and a mom. Okay, so she has a newborn baby. She has a second one on the way. And she's going to talk about how she's been able to go from, you know, growing up in Alaska to being a Marine. She was a Marine. Uh, then she spent, you know, several years as a top personal trainer, built her online training business. Now she's a mom. She's expanding her business. Next is Manuel Suarez. Manuel Suarez is one of the top digital marketers in the country. Um, he is the face behind when he talks about it on Saturday, many of the brands that you know today, individuals that you know today, and this is the guy that's getting them out there and making sure that they get the attention that they need to expand their brands. Um, over here, we've got Ivan Anz. Ivan Anz is a partner in Wealth Dynamics. He's also the youngest family office founder in history. Um, and so he's, you know, a, he's a serial entrepreneur. He's got dozens of business ventures internationally. We've got Artie Marin. Artie Marin is a uh, business consultant internationally for almost 50 years now. There's not a business or industry Artie has not consulted in successfully. So Artie is one of my main guys that helps me grow Wealth Dynamics. Um, a lot of the, the, the growth and expansion you see comes from consulting with Artie. And then finally is a guy named Sean Wolf. Sean Wolf is from Alaska. He was stationed in the Air Force. Um, I know him from back in my bodybuilding days. Sean Wolf is a five-time uh, national bodybuilding champion. He coaches celebrities. He coaches professional athletes. He co coaches professional bodybuilders. He's also built an online brand and an online business. Uh, he's now into investing and all sorts of other business ventures. But the point of the boot camp is called In the Arena. Okay, In the Arena. And it's based on Teddy Roosevelt's speech about the man in the arena. Okay, and if you're on the webinar today or watching the replay, okay, some of my clients, some of my followers, you guys are busy hustling on a Saturday. I get it. You're going to watch the YouTube or listen to the podcast. I love that. You're in the arena when you do that. Being in the arena means that you're overcoming the barriers. You're overcoming the obstacles. You're ignoring the critics and the haters. You're striving for your goals. You're learning. You're improving. Right. And these are all people who started at the bottom and they either built or rebuilt themselves completely into being the top 1% of their space. And this is not going to be rah rah where we make you walk on coals and get you all jacked up and excited. And then you go home and have the same bad habits and limiting beliefs. This is going to be actionable stuff. And after the webinar is done, we're going to work with you. And how do you implement what you just learned? Okay. So everyone that's on today gets a ticket to this. The second thing is the Blueprint to Financial Freedom book, okay? Um, so I want to just show you that really quick. If you've not gotten a copy of this yet, this is my book, Blueprint to Financial Freedom. Uh, we usually sell this for $14.99.
Um, but instead of that, we're going to give that to you away for free as well. You cover your shipping, which is, um, I think 10 bucks, seven, eight bucks or 10 bucks. But if you go to jerryfeta.com forward slash B2F promo, you can get a free copy of the book. Okay. You just enter the, the code free B2F. We'll ship the book out to you. You get that completely free. Okay. And then the final thing is we developed a new software called a wealth potential analysis. And this is where Bree is going to come in. Okay. Um, we've developed something called the wealth potential analysis. Bree and I have been working with clients the last two weeks on this, um, you know, really making uh, good progress with people on their finances, helping them out tremendously. And so this is something that we spent the last one to two months developing. Um, and I'm going to share it, but I actually want Bree to talk a little bit about this with you guys before we jump into today's lesson, um, because she's done several of these with clients already. Hey, guys. So this wealth potential analysis is a really great opportunity for everyone to get a clear look at their finances, because it's kind of like talking to the mirror. It's not you doing this with one of us like Jerry or myself. You're asking yourself these honest yes, no, maybe questions, answering as honestly as you can. And this is going to help you see where we need to work on when it comes to finances or to literacy or to security. Everything is going to circle back to just how you're standing in your financial position right now, uh, as you can see right here. So we're going to be covering planning, mindset, income, proper protection, savings, tax and legal, investments, stress, basic principles, and help. All of these are going to be answered just by these 100 questions. So at the end of the assessment, you're actually going to get a graph like this that will show you where you stand, if you're in the acceptable range, if you're needing improvement, or if it's critical, and we need to address it as soon as possible. <laughs> so um, as you can see, you don't want to be down here depressed, uh, disorganized or incompetent or scarce or insecure, uh, diminishing with your savings, uncompliant when it comes to the taxes and legal side. You don't want to be contracting on your investments. You don't want to be unhealthy when it comes to their stress level. And you don't want to be unworkable with your basic principles. And you don't want to be resisting help. That's really what we want to offer. And the biggest help we can give you is the financial education. Everyone should want to be as educated as they can be. So here's awesome. a... Oh, you got it. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I was going to say, guys, this is something that that we spent um, the last two months developing. Um, you know, we invested time and money into this. And it's something we're giving away for free. When, when I developed this, the guy I developed it with was like, great, you know, you can start charging for this. And I told him, no, we don't want to. I was like, why would we charge for this? That makes zero sense. I'm not trying to get money out of someone by showing them where they're at financially. I want to help them, right? And so the goal is, is we do this for free. You know, that way you're able to see where you're at with your finances and actually get the help. You have to understand my background, and it's very similar to Breeze, I bet. We weren't going to walk into a Merrill Lynch office and sit down with a financial advisor and say, hey, we've got six or seven figures already. Go make money for us. Right? I grew up poor. I didn't have that. So if someone didn't go out of their way and give me something free, guys, when I got started, I had to borrow the $100 to pay for my life insurance exam. I didn't even have a hundred bucks to my name when I first got started. And so if that was a barrier, Jerry Fed wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be teaching you because I would have never have gotten started in the first place. So um, schedule that with Bree. Bree, do you want to pop your link for the, the WPA in the chat, the wealth potential analysis? Um, if you fill that out, you know, that's going to send you your results. Bree will get them as well. And it's also going to route you to be able to schedule a free consultation with Brianna um, and, and get help on, on going over your assessment results. So I'll give her a second to type that out. And then um, today we're going to jump into Sacred Account Saturday. And this is, again, about the sacred account. It's the concept of using life insurance to become your own bank, right? And, and I let the cat out of the bag because I think a lot of us watching are, are understanding of that concept. If you're not, we're going to teach you that today. Um, and Bree is going to be presenting uh, the, the beginning portion of this. So I'm excited to turn this over to her, but I'm going to share my screen here and uh, we'll let Bree take things away here. All right. I'm getting this uh, wealth potential analysis link posted right quick for you guys. So this is about to go into the chat now. Awesome. And while she's doing that, I'll filibuster. Um, and, and guys, as we're going through this, I want to go ahead and set your mindset. Okay. I do not want you focusing on the product today, okay? I want you focusing on the concepts, 
Like I said, if you're learning your driver's license test, how do I drive? It doesn't matter if you know how an engine works, right? You need to know how to drive a car. And so today we're going to teach you how do you drive a car? And the concepts that we're going to teach you, we're going to ask you to do only two things. Change one thing about your finances and add one extra step to what you do already. That's it. We're not telling you go change everything in your finances. We're saying change one thing about your finances. And I'll give you a hint. That thing is going to be the location where you put your money. That's it, right? And then add one step. And we'll talk about what that one step is as well. Um, but Brie, are you ready to roll on this one? I'm ready. Let's do uh, it. Awesome. So I also just want to give you guys a quick back intro here. I came on as a client first, and it was Jerry that put me on to the sacred account concept and becoming my own bank. And when I opened my account, it took me eight months to go from being paycheck to paycheck and in debt to being completely debt free and out of paycheck to paycheck. And I did that on a 2000 a month poverty level income without increasing my income. It really comes down to just where you're putting the money. So this concept works. It works if you've got six to eight figures. It works if you've got one figure like I did. It's going to work for everyone. Um, so the sacred account is actually just a, a simpler name of the actual title, which is high early cash value, dividend paying whole life insurance policy. So going into this, why we're here today wanting to discuss this with you and why Jerry commits himself every Saturday to being here and giving this education is because the vision we have is to help millions of families, individuals, and entrepreneurs financially fund a life of abundance and prosperity in all dynamics. And so to do that, it's going to take education. Um, we're also on the goal to build the largest financial services company in U.S. history with over 250,000 ambassadors across the United States, Canada, and Puerto Rico. And that's because when you learn this information, you have to share it with the world. You feel obligated to. Jerry always talks about how this system is a trap, and we see it. So we want to get out there and actually disrupt and shake up what I call the matrix and free people from that trap. So we're here to help families, individuals, and entrepreneurs achieve four things. And those main things are financial education, financial solvency, financial freedom, and we're here to share the truth about money. And it comes from looking at the numbers, the statistics behind it. For financial education, over half of the U.S. adults feel anxiety when it comes to their finances. That over half, that's that's really bad. When we try to treat money like oxygen, that means over half of the people are scared of breathing. And that's a condition. We don't want that for anybody. Financial solvency, two in three US families don't have an emergency fund. And for financial freedom, 60% of non-retirees don't think their investments are on track. And only 33.4% of Americans have professional financial guidance. And what's really interesting about these statistics here is the correlation. A third of U.S. families do have an emergency fund. A third of, uh, of non-retirees know their investments are on track. And a third of Americans do have that professional financial guidance. Guys, it's the same third. It's the ones that have the support and the knowledge. They're the ones that are secure and they're not struggling to breathe day to day. So that's what we want to help you guys achieve and, and I just want to add with that, like kind of plugging again, the wealth potential analysis, the blueprint book, like this is right, why we do these things for free, right? Like when someone is, is watching this, like one of the first things that's always going to come up is like, what's the catch, right? And the catch is, is you've got to, you've got to study, you know, you've got to invest time. You've got to learn, you've got to change the way you do things. That's the catch, right? But if you're talking about a financial catch, if you're already losing money to banks, Wall Street and the IRS, that already is the catch right? Like that's a much bigger catch than I need to study for 10 minutes a day, or I need to change where I deposit my funds. And here's what we see a lot of people running into. They're living the number one lifestyle of a deferral lifestyle. A lot of us are working 40 to 60 hours per week, doing a 40, to, uh, 40 year to life sentence, trading our time for money, hoping beyond hope that one day we might be able to retire and everyone is hoping that they're going to die before the money runs out. That's that's not a way to live. Um, but there is another option. There is another path. And that's achieving passive income from investments. That means putting your money to work 
and making sure that your passive income, the money working for itself, is more than your savings, expenses, and taxes. When you achieve that passive income number, you no longer have to trade time for money. And that is a possibility. And we're going to show you how to do it with this tool. Also, just want to point out this scary statistic here. Five out of 100 people will be financially secure at retirement age. And that's coming from our Social Security Administration taking money from our paychecks. <laughs> <laughs> Now we're using a 200 year old proven concept delivered by the best team in the financial industry, our money multiplier uh, agency that helps with our fulfillment to get these out. And we've also partnered with the best companies that have a 100 to 200 year track record of financial stability. And that means we're using One America, Lafayette Life Insurance, Guardian Life, Security Mutual Life, Penn Mutual, and then there's a couple others as well. And guys, just on this point, um, you know, we won't get lost in the product today, but when you work with us with the sacred account, you're getting to partner with three different groups, right? So there's Wealth Dynamics, there's, you know, my team, Bree's team, our, our group here. Um, and we're helping you with, you know, education, with strategy, with moving forward on your finances. Okay, I want you to think of us as your coach. Okay, now here's the money multiplier. Their job is to get you through to an approval with the insurance company so that you can actually get, you know, your policy like issued and start becoming your own bank. Um, I just spoke with their CEO this week. Guys, they're issuing 110 sacred accounts per week. 110 per week. That's insane. Like that's a ton. Think about that. 110, there's 52 weeks in a year. That's the kind of volume that they're putting through. They're the number one in the nation at getting people set up and approved. So that's why we've partnered with them. Then there's the actual insurance companies. Okay. I want you to think about who you bank with right now. Who is it? JP Morgan? Is it Wells Fargo? It doesn't matter. The sacred account as a concept has been around longer than the modern day banking concept and also longer than the IRS. Right, these companies have 100 to 200 year track record, so they are, they predate the tax code. These companies predate the tax code. So when you think about it, like where are you putting your money, and where do the wealthy put their money? They're not leaving it in bank accounts. They're not putting it in Wall Street. Did you know the 401k has only been around since the 1980s? It's not even as old as my dad. Right, I want to put money in something that's got that 100, 200 year track record of success, not something that's 40, 50 years old. Um, so I just wanted to add that in, but I'm turning back over to Brie here. All right. So we're actually trying to dispel some of the mysteries of money. Can anyone tell me in the chat here, uh, what's the difference between money versus currency? Does anyone know what money is or what currency would be? Let us know. Yeah. Let us know in the chat who can tell us what's, what's the difference between money and currency. Christine says paper versus flow. Okay. Means of exchange, currency exchange for value, uh, currency exchange for value. Money is physical currency and money is physical currency is online. Some good answers. Okay. So um, the real difference here, and I'll, I'll go ahead and just answer for, for Brie here is currency is a means of exchange. Anyone that said means of exchange is correct on currency, right? Money is both a means of exchange, but it's also a store of value. Okay, most of us don't know that. We think money, we think it's the same thing. Brie, before you started working with us, if someone would have said money or currency, what would, what would your response have been? They're the same, dollar bills. <laughs> same thing, right? But, but think about this, guys. If you held dollar bills in the last you know, 24 months, you lost value. You did not store your value. Currency does not store, store value. It's not, it's not intended to, right? Money does. And so money means that we can exchange it. There is flow to it, like Christine said, but it's also something that stores its value. If I keep it, it either is worth the same or more in the future. Awesome. Yes, uh, Dugan's right. The dollar is taking a dive as it always has. <laughs> now, what investments actually use compound interest? I need you to think about this for a minute. When we're doing compound interest, it means that the value always has to be going up. 
just like a staircase, it's never going to be dropping. So if you think about your retirement accounts, when they're fluctuating and going up and down because of stock market performance, that's not count compounding. It's losing value and then returning back. So it's not going to be working. Now, if you're using the concept we're using here today, you're going to see this is truly compound interest. It means it is forever adding on. If you put $100 in, then your interest is going to be based off $100 up to the next highest amount. Then it's going to be 110 or whatever being in, put into interest on that. It's just going to keep staircasing up. And I'm just sketching this out, guys. Compounding interest, it's principal plus interest times interest. So we had a, a $10,000 growing at 4% right? So that's now our principal and interest. Next year, the principal plus the interest grows again at 4%. And then it grows again at 4%. And it grows again at 4%. So what Bree is saying is at any point, if it didn't grow, or if it lost, or if you withdrew it, it's no longer compounding. You cannot build a brick, a wall brick by brick. Think about that. Like it's like a staircase. You can't build a staircase if all of a sudden the stair is missing. Or all of a sudden it just turns into a landing and there's no more stairs or you, you step on it and it falls through. You don't have a real staircase. No one's going to want to go up that, right? So the myth is the, the compounding interest. And we're told like, Bree, we're told like the 401k, the mutual funds, index universal life insurance, bank accounts. These are all things that people say are compounding interest vehicles, right? Mm -hmm. I, they, they say it but we don't see it. <laughs> exactly. And there's only one of them out there that truly has compounding interest that we'll talk to you about today. And another thing that he just brought up the 401k. So Jerry on the 401k, you know, that's a deferral plan, right? Deferred compensation. We're putting our dollars somewhere where we can't access them until we're much older in our retirement age. And when we do that, What's going to happen with the dollars? Are they going to be worth more now? Or are they going to be worth more when I'm 65, 69 and a half? They're going to be worth more today. So why would I want to put my dollars somewhere where they're going to be worth less and I'm not going to be able to use them now for my wealth building and my living now? And on top of that, taxes. Do our taxes go down or do they continue to increase? We see our taxes going up. So our current matrix system is telling everybody, put in money to your 401k, put in money to your retirement plan, and it'll be there when down the road, maybe, but it's also tied to the stock market. And so it's going to keep fluctuating our performance there, but taxes are going to be going up. So you're putting your dollars in someone else's hands to decrease in value and pay more for them with the taxes. It's not a great system. And I, I heard this on um, on Wednesday. I, I, Brie was on the same webinar. I was a friend of mine said this, and I I was sharing this with a client the other day. And it's um you know the concept of of you know let's say that you you were buying bread and you're buying milk at the grocery store, right? And you know I'm 31 years old, turning 31 on Monday. So let's say that you know if I put my bread in the milk I just bought and I put it in the freezer, and I leave it there for the next 29 years. Right. Why 29 years? Because 29 years is when someone can retire. Because I put it in there for 29 years. And basically, you know, I leave it there. Let's pretend that this magic freezer will triple my bread and my milk. If I put in one loaf of bread, I put in one gallon of milk, it's going to triple the three of them. Right. And so that I do that. I put it in for 29 years and then I do exactly that. 29 years goes by. I open my magical freezer. Boom. I've got three gallons of milk. I've got three loaves of bread. Okay, pretty awesome, right? And th and that's this this concept of are the dollars worth more today or in the future? Okay, well it's cool that that happens, but guess what? The last twenty nine years I didn't eat. My bread and milk was in the freezer. I didn't get to use it, right? Bread and milk, I am at automatically think, man, I could make French toast. You know, like I could do some cool stuff with that today rather than waiting twenty nine years. Now the other thing on it is, you know, not only did I not get to use that bread and use that milk. But in the future, who's going to agree with me that when I pull the bread out after 29 years, it's going to be freezer burned and the milk's going to be chunky. Even if it froze, even if it tripled, like I would rather have one good loaf of bread and one good gallon of milk that I can use today instead of a freezer burned chunky three loaves of bread, three gallons of milk that I can't really use next time. So that's this idea of waiting is we want you to use your wealth now, right? Because while it's in the freezer, what, what the freezer doesn't justify is Wall Street's using it. The only guarantee there is fees. 
whether it goes up, whether it goes down, that's the only guarantee in that system. That's exactly it. And then, so on that topic, you know, is it what you make or what you keep? Can anyone put in the comments, which one is it? Is it what you make or what you keep? Dugan someone says, says neither. keep, yo. Someone says keep, Dugan says keep. It is, it's gonna be what you keep. Uh, now, is it what you keep or where you're keeping it? Ian, spot on, Bingo. it's gonna be where, exactly. You guys got it. Bingo. And we kind okay. of touched on uh, the retirement accounts. So that's that's why we wanna focus on where are we keeping it? We already know that the retirement account is not gonna be a good solution. So here's a really great example for where we could put our money and how it's gonna work for us and not against us. So over here on the right side of the screen, we've got our bank. Okay, let's say we have 25,000 just sitting in the bank and we want to go and buy a car that's 25,000. Well, we could take our money out of the bank, right? This is what most Americans do when we go buy a car. Everyone out here has cars. We're gonna take our money out of the bank because we see that even though we may be earning 4% interest because we have an insane, crazy, cool bank that gives us something reasonable, we're gonna be wanting to keep that money there, but we also really want a car. And we don't want to pay the 6% on a car loan for 60 months. So we take it out of the bank and we go and we put and buy the car. Well, now we have no dollars, but we have a car. And then if we do it with the bank in harmony, doing our own banking concept, why take the money out? Why not keep your money in the bank? If it's earning you 4%, you would want to keep that there. And you're going to borrow against the money. You're going to keep the 25,000 there and you're going to take a loan. For the 25,000 and you're going to go and put that on your car oh change screens <laughs> oh, let me go back uh, here we go i'm on uh there we are okay so you're going to take your 25,000 because you don't want to pay six percent or you you don't want to pay the six percent on the car but you're going to borrow against it right you're taking the loan instead of pulling your money out take a loan against your money buy the car for the 25,000 and pay yourself back for those 60 months. You're still gonna be making your 483.32 car payment, but your 25,000 never left your bank. So it is still gonna be earning that 4%. So at the end of the 60 months, your 25,000 that you've kept in the bank is now worth 30,525. You've made $1,526 by buying your car. How many of you guys can look at your recent car purchases and say, I made more money than what it cost me? If we're not using our own bank, we're not able to say that because it's the bank that's getting the interest in that case. They're earning for our dollars. So rather than just using cash, this is showing how even though you're paying 6%, you're still making money because you're leveraging your dollars. It's earning in two places at once. You're earning here because you're not paying that interest and you're earning in your bank because you're earning the 4% interest. Right. And, and guys, what's happening here is 4% on, on 25,000. That's compounding interest on an increasing balance. You put in 25,000 each year, your principal value grows by 4% and then it's multiplying against another 4%, right? And so you're getting compounding interest off of an increasing balance. And that's why at the end of 60 months, you've got 30,000 there. Versus when you do a loan, you know, the car loan, it's 25,000, it's 6%, but it's 6% calculated off of a decreasing balance. Every month you're paying principal back. And so that 6% comes off a smaller and smaller principal amount and you're paying less and less. And so that's why at the end of this, you paid 28,999, but, you know, conventional wisdom tells us, well, I would rather, you know, pay cash for the car, right? People love paying cash for things. I used to be a Dave Ramsey guy. I was endorsed by Dave Ramsey in eight states in the United States of America. And I was paid cash. I paid cash for my car. I did all this stuff, right? One of the, my, my worst mistakes, I remember buying a car in 2015 and I went in with cash and I you know, did the whole deal. And I was like, man, Uncle Dave would be so proud of me, right? But the problem was, is I lost out because the money was not invested. I didn't have uninterrupted compounding. Okay, and so by borrowing, I leave my money there growing and I'm able to earn what's called arbitrage, the difference in my profit versus my expense. My profit, 30,525 minus my expense. So I'm netting $1,526 by borrowing, 
right? And that's, that's again, a paradigm shift because so many of us, we, we get emotionally attached to, you know, these financial concepts and ideas, but we never really inspect the math here. Okay. Now we're going to tell you just to change one thing. And Brie kind of mentioned this already, right? So if we look at the car example, same math, same everything, we're going to change one thing and add one step. And that one thing is instead of borrowing and depositing from someone else's bank, you're going to do it in your own bank. Okay, you're going to set up your own bank. And that one changes instead of using a traditional bank account, we're going to use whole life insurance, specially designed whole life insurance. Okay, the one step we're going to add is you're going to pay your bank back instead of someone else's, right? So Bree, do you want to jump into this with people? Yeah, sure. So uh, with the sacred account, this is what it is, okay? It's a whole life insurance that's lasting your entire life, your whole life. And it's going to pay out a tax-free death benefit to whomever you choose. And it has a tax-free savings account. That's the cash value. And it's over 170 years old. Guys, the sacred account or the high early cash value dividend paying life insurance policies have been around since 1845. That's, that's almost 200 years old. And you're going to be getting your money growing at 3 to 5% compounding tax-free for the rest of your life. And it's guaranteed to grow and guaranteed against loss. So when we look at just the age of this account, the fact that it has these guarantees, that's a really strong word to use in the finance industry, but it's accurate. Just since 2001, we've had 536 banks fail, but this has never lost money and it's only made money. And you get to be an equity partner with a multi-billion dollar insurance company and share in their profits and get dividends. It's better than your bank account. <laughs> And, and not only that, open. guys, yeah, I was, I was going to add to this. Not only that, this is the safest place to put money. Like most of us, we save in a bank because we think it's safe, right? We think that that the money is is protected. Um, and we're going to talk about today how that's not the, the case. And you can look at real life right now. What just happened with Silicon Valley Bank? How safe was that? What happened with Signature Bank? What happened with First Republic Bank? There's there's several other banks that are about to fail. Over in Europe, quite, Credit Suisse went down. Okay, the third largest bank in Switzerland, Deutsche Bank, is about to fail, right? So if you're putting your money there, like the people in Silicon Valley Bank thought they were protected. They thought their money was safe, and it wasn't. So, Bree, do you want to just give people some just on the safety of, of the sacred account itself? So for the safety, you're getting to know that you're guaranteed against loss, right? Devaluation of currency, the inflation, that's not a concern anymore. You're guaranteed against that. You're getting guarantees to grow your money when you put it in there. Every dollar you put in is guaranteed to grow. You're not paying taxes and you're not reliant on the stock market. So you're not getting the heartache and the headache of watching it go up and down, up and down. And you're getting the protection of not having to deal with management fees. That's something you have to deal with with your retirement account, not with the sacred account. And you're also protected from creditors and protected from lawsuits. That's something your bank can't do. And it's a total privacy contract. The contract is between you and the insurance company, and you're the one that's in control. So this is the banking quadrant. Everyone's playing a part in this. Now, how does it work? So we actually have the depositors, right? The little piggy bank here. Depositors are working really hard, backbreaking labor, and they're putting their hard-earned income into the bank. And the bank is going to be borrowing against those deposits to invest. And what he's showing here is, yes, when you put your money in the bank, the national average is actually less than 0.4% interest. So the bank will be paying you 0.4% interest on your money that you put in with them. And while it's there, they're actually paying you that interest because they're using your money as a loan. They're going out and giving your money to borrowers for purchases and investments where they're actually going to be charging those borrowers 4%, 6%, 11%. We're going to do 4%. So they're charging the borrowers 4% on your money while they're only paying you 0.4% to loan it to them. And then because they're earning a profit here, right, 4% minus 0.4, you're going to be getting 3.6% positive spread on your dollars the bank is earning. They're going to be paying that out to their shareholders. 
I know I said that 536 banks have failed since 2001, and you wonder how when they're making this type of a spread of money, but that's that's what they do. This is what is currently happening with our modern banking system. Every dollar you're putting in, you're getting pennies compared to the bank, and they're able to do this again and again and again, and this is fractional reserve lending. Now, guys, this is where I'm going to just jump in on this part because I want to drive this point home. Back to the car example. Okay. We tell you change one thing and add one step. That's it. Right. So that one, that one thing we're changing is do not put your money in the bank anymore. Instead, you're going to put it in a life insurance policy. That's the one thing you're changing. Right now, some of us are like, oh, why would I do that? I was talking with someone the other day and they were like, well, what about my 401k plan and my bank account and my Roth guys? That is called financial marketing. You need to understand the difference between marketing and education. Watching a McDonald's commercial does not make you a nutritionist, right? It makes you a marketed to consumer that's going to go buy food from McDonald's. They can tell you whatever they want to tell you on the commercial and make it look really good. But the reality is when you put money in a bank, they are borrowing against your money. They're paying you 0 0.40. They're putting your money at risk. I like to explain this as a car. Right. Brie is a pretty smart gal. So I'm going to I'm going to just run my business proposition by Brie with her on her car. Let's see if she says yes or no to this. So Brie, you're going on a trip soon, right? Yes, I am, actually. So so, you know, when you go to the airport, you can leave your car in the, the their, their parking garage and pay them to keep it safe and store it while you're gone. Yeah. OK, so I want to set one of those up and just tell me so far if you would put your car there. So you know, you would park your car, you know, um, you would pay me a little bit for this, for the storage to set it up. Um, and then basically you'd be able to go, your, your car wouldn't be a worry. I would take care of it for you. Sound good so far? I'm with you there. I like that idea. That's fair. Okay. Awesome. Now, when you get back, you don't know this yet, but when you get back, you'll have found out that I took your car and I put it on Toro and I rented it out to other people while you were gone without telling you. Uh, and I didn't pay you any of the profit. Sounding like my teenage son, are you? <laughs> That's it. Not okay, okay I know with you, that. <laughs> I know you don't like that rule, but but here's where it gets better. When you come back, your car may or may not be there. Like it could still be with someone on Turo. They're still using it when you return from your trip and come back to my my lot from the airport. I don't think I'm going to be keeping my car with you. <laughs> okay, well, hear me out. I've got a couple more rules here. Um, now. There is insurance on the vehicle, but I do want to disclose that we don't pay the premiums. And so if your car gets wrecked, our insurance is not going to cover it. You're going to have to cover it with your insurance and it will cause your premiums to go up because your insurance is going to have to pay for the wreck that someone else got with your car. I'm paying for someone else's mistake. Hmm. I don't, yeah, I'm still not, I'm probably going to drive myself to my vacation. <laughs> and guys, it sounds stupid, right? Like when we explain it like this with a car, it's like, why? But this is what people do with their money. What I just described with your car is what you currently are doing with your money. You're parking it in a storage facility called a bank. While you're gone, the bank is taking your money, not your car, your money, and letting other people use it. Right now, when you come back, it may or may not be there. That's what happened with Silicon Valley Bank is when they came to get their money out, the money wasn't there. Why? Because the person using their money lost the money, right? And we hear about FDIC insurance. Guys, the FDIC currently has enough money to cover 1%, 1% of all deposits in the US. Not only that, but the banks lobbied about a decade ago to no longer have to pay the premiums on the FDIC insurance, meaning it is not being funded. You do not have a fully funded insurance policy. There's like someone renting your car and the insurance isn't being paid. So if they lose your money, then when it comes back to you, you're the one that has to pay for it. The FDIC is going to have to borrow money from the U.S. Treasury. Who funds the U.S. Treasury? You and I do with our tax dollars. So our insurance goes up via our taxes go up to cover that bill. So not only did your money get lost, not only did the bank make a bunch of profit on it before they lost it, but you're the one that's going to bail them out and it's going to come at the expense of your taxes and your kids' taxes. So like Bria is saying, like, we're not telling you anything crazy. This is already happening. 
And like Bree's conclusion, she's like, well, I'll just drive myself to the airport. I'll just do my own car, right? That's the conclusion we want you to have with your banking. So we're telling you change one thing and that's the location, okay? So back to this example right here. So back to the car. So let's say you're buying a car, you put 25,000 in. Now the difference being, you put this in the bank of you. You set up your own banking system. And then you deposit the money that you already are going to deposit anyways into your bank. I want you to think about how much money do you save per month right now on average? Let's just redirect that. We're not telling you go save oodles of more income. We're saying take the money you already save and let's just put that in your own bank instead of someone else's. Now, the reality is this is a magical bank that really does pay you 4%, right? It's not, it's not 0.4 like some banks are. This is actually 4%. So you're earning 4% on your deposit right? And then basically what's happening is you deposit the money in, you're earning 4%. You're now the banker. This is your bank. It's the bank of Bree. It's the bank of Jerry. It's the bank of Christine. It's the bank of Martin. It's the bank of Lawrence, right? And so you have the money growing here. You as the banker can then loan the money to yourself. Okay. Now here is where you're stuck again. You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Why would I borrow against my own money? Why would I loan my own money? Why would I pay interest on my own money? We're going to get to that, right? So you're borrowing against your own money because your money is still growing. We just talked about on the previous slide, if you take out cash and pay for the car with cash, you don't make 4% anymore, right? And so by borrowing, you are making 4%. Now the difference is, and we already looked at the math on this, if you're paying 6% on a car loan for 60 months is 483.32, you're paying 28,999, your future value growth is 30,000. So you make about 15, $1,600 in profit there just with the regular bank, but the difference is this is your bank. So that monthly payment goes back to you, not to Wells Fargo, right? If I have a $483 monthly payment, we said change one thing, add one step, change one thing, meaning put the money in the life insurance instead, add one step, pay yourself back, be an honest banker, right? If you had a car loan with, with you know Wells Fargo, for example, and they said, hey, it's a 483 a month payment. You wouldn't question that at all. You'd be like, yes, master, let me make that $483 payment to you. I'm never going to miss it because I don't want you to mess up my credit score, right? We won't even get into the fact that the credit score is, is created by a private corporation. That is not actually like a, a government thing. Like it's, it's groups the banks own and work with. We won't get into that today. But this instead, when it comes to, okay, I'm going to borrow against my own money, people are like, well, why would I do that? I'm going to make a payment back to myself. Why would I do that? Well, let me ask you a better question. Why do you respect the bank's money so much more than yours that when they tell you to make a payment back on a loan, you, you say no problem. But when we tell you to make a payment back on your own money, you question it. Where else are you going to put that payment? Like, let's say you don't pay yourself back. Because on life insurance, you don't have to. Let's say that that never happens. You don't have to pay yourself back. And you've just got 483 a month going on. Where are you going to put that? please don't tell me it's going to be Bank of America or Wall Street. Shopping. <laughs> right? And, and don't, tell me it, don't tell me it's shopping either, right? Like this is, this is the behavior change of this. People are like, what's the catch? The catch is, is you have to think differently. You have to change your operating basis. So we're going to pay our bank back. We're going to be an honest banker. And the difference here is that if Brie pays herself 483 a month back, Versus paying back the regular bank. Let's say, Bree, you have a regular car payment with, with um, you know, First National Bank of Alaska, and you pay them 483 on the car payment. And then the next day, you're like, man, I need to invest in something or I need to go buy something. What's the likelihood of them giving you that car payment back? It's going to be zero. They're not going to do it. They're going to say, sorry, <laughs> we took it already. That's our money now. Right? Now, with Bree's own bank, she's the banker. So she's the borrower and she's the banker. She can go to herself and say, Brie, we have a trip coming up. We need $483. We just sent in a $483 payment. Let's, let's work together on this, Brie. Let's lend ourselves the 483 back. And Brie can look in the mirror and smile and say, approves. You get the loan. And she can issue that money back to herself. This is called a two-way loan. When you pay your own bank back, you can pull the money right back out again, which is different than a regular bank. The other thing is you're paying interest, right, to borrow but you're paying interest to a company that you're an owner in. You're an equity owner in the insurance company. So people are like, why would I pay interest on my own money? Well, because A, your money still grows and it earns a higher rate than the interest cost. We just looked at this, you're making profit. 
but B, the interest you're paying is going to a company you're the owner in. Why would you go to a competitor bank and pay interest to Bank of America when you could go pay interest to your own bank and make a profit by doing so? Right? So this is the concept of it. And, and really, the way that this would work, and I would just handle the borrowing thing, is on the loans, why borrow against our money? When we withdraw money, we lose future, future growth. Okay, as an investor myself, as someone that does real estate and, and different things with my own money, I hate losing assets and I hate paying taxes. Those are the two worst things that can happen to an investor, losing an asset, paying taxes. Okay, true or true. When I withdraw money, I lose future growth on the asset because I no longer own the asset. It's true. Like you, you got rid of the asset. You can't have the growth anymore. So as an investor, why would I do that to myself on purpose? I understand if you put it in the stock market or Bitcoin and you lost your assets on accident, but we're saying you, you put the, the, the trigger up to your head and pulled it yourself. You sold the asset. That was your deal. It wasn't the stock market. Like when we withdraw money, we're purposefully losing the asset. We're the ones doing that to ourselves. When we also withdraw money, if we withdraw money to gain, we pay taxes on our gains. I don't want to do either of those two things. Worst of all, not only do I lose the asset, but I trade the asset. I withdraw money. I've traded an asset, you know, for example, real estate or a stock or a life insurance policy. This is something that gains value. I traded that asset for cash. Okay, cash loses value. Why would I trade an appreciating asset, something that's going to go up in value over time for a piece of paper that literally has no actual value behind it that loses money over time? Right? If you're in the business of trading cash for paper, I've got a bunch of rolls of toilet paper in my bathroom I just got from Costco, and I'll gladly trade you those for your house. Right, the, 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 the mentality there, you've got an appreciating asset. So borrowing funds means that you keep your money growing in the asset at a rate greater than what you borrow for. You pay no taxes, and you keep ownership of the assets. Right, And this leads us into the concept. Right, I said we weren't going to spend a lot of time dwelling on the product. Um, when you deposit money in a bank, here's an idea of what's occurring, right? So let's say let's say that Brie has $100,000 and she deposits that in, in, let's say I'm a banker and I, I own you know a branch of Wells Fargo and she deposits it in my bank. And I say, say Brie, this is your lucky day. We're paying 4% right now. Okay, and Brie doesn't know any better. She doesn't know how to become her own bank yet. And so she's like, okay, cool. That's more than I get at the other bank. So Brie puts her money in, she's earning 4%. Right now, I'm the banker. And so the bank, you have to realize the bank is in the business of borrowing against other people's money. How do you think they afford to pay you interest? A bank would be bankrupt if they just paid you interest and they didn't have a way to earn more than what they pay. So they're in the business of paying you interest so then that they can borrow against your money and go make more than what they pay you. Right? Like that doesn't make any sense to me, but that's what's happening. So let's say I'm the banker and I'm 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 the owner of the Wells Fargo branch. And I say, good, I now have Bree's hundred thousand dollars. Okay, and I know that Martin, he's looking to buy a house. Right. And so I, I go to Martin, I say, Martin, I'm gonna loan you a hundred thousand dollars at seven percent. You can use that, you can go buy the house. Right. So Martin does that. Martin buys the house. Now, what happens? Martin is the buyer of the house, he gets the mortgage, the money from that loan pays the seller. What is the seller going to do? The seller is going to deposit that money in the bank. So I'm paying the seller now 4% on the same initial 100000 that belongs to Brie. Brie has no idea that her money just went through the hands of three different groups. Okay, so I'm paying 4%. Now I've got the money back again. And I say, cool, uh, I'm going to go loan this out to Lawrence. Lawrence wants a new Corvette. I'm going to loan it to Lawrence at 8% on a Corvette. I'm paying Brie 4 right? And so Lawrence is going to pay me 8 Right. And so Lawrence, when he buys the Corvette, that money from the car sale goes to the dealer. The dealer deposits the money in the bank again. So I'm the banker. I've got the money back again. And I say, that's great. I've got the money back. I'm going to, I'm going to loan this to Dave. I know Dave has been trying to fix up his kitchen. I'm going to loan it to Dave at 9%. So Dave takes this money from me. He borrows it at 9% to do a home remodel. When he does the home remodel, he has to pay the contractor. Okay. The contractor doesn't just keep the money in his pocket. He puts it in the bank. So I'm paying the contractor 4% interest on his deposit. And then we loan it to someone on a debt consolidation loan, right? They've got high interest credit cards. And so we're going to charge them 12%. Currently, they're, they're paying 19 on their credit cards with Visa. And so we're going to say, hey, we'll do debt consolidation at 12%. 
right? So we loan it to someone who's at 12% for debt consolidation. They pay off their credit cards. The credit card companies, what are they going to do? They're going to put that money in a bank. And so Bree's over here making 4%, but on the mortgage deal, Martin's paying me seven, I'm paying three in interest. I made a 3% spread. On the car deal, Larry, Lawrence is paying me 8%. You know, I'm paying four in interest. I'm making a 4% spread. On the home remodel with Dave, Dave's paying me 9% interest. I'm paying 4%. I'm making a profit of 5%. On the debt consolidation, right? I'm paying, you know, uh, there I'm being paid 12% interest. My cost of, of that on the deposit is 4%. My spread is 8%. We total this all up and I'm making 20%, right? And, and so some of us might look at this and we're like, well, how much more money am I making than Brie as the banker? And, you know, the incorrect math would be 16. Okay, well, she's making four, I'm making 20, 20 minus four is 16. No, 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 no. How many times more money am I making than Brie? How many times does four go into 20? That's five times. Right. If you remember arithmetic in high school to take something from decimal and turn it into percentage, you add two zeros at the end. I'm making 500% on Bree's money, putting none of my own at risk. Realize I did not loan my own deposits out. We're going to talk about in a minute what I did with my deposits, but I took Bree's money. Right now, legally, banks are allowed to borrow 98 to 100% of your deposits put them at risk and use those to make profit and exactly how much profit. Let's talk about that for a second. This is from Bauer Financial. When you leave money in a bank on an annual basis, they're making anywhere from four to 1300% on your money. Guys, this is currently happening. This is not a theory. This, if you've got dollars in a savings account and a credit union and a bank account, it doesn't matter where it is. This currently happens to your money. They're making 400 to 1300% on your dollars, putting your money at risk, not really being upfront with you about it, paying you little to nothing. And like Bree said, how the hell are these banks going out of business? Like how did Silicon Valley Bank fail making this kind of money? And the answer lies in the fact that, that they only have about 30 days worth of reserves on hand. That's the average bank. And if anything happens in the economy, they lose money, people take out more deposits than they, than they predicted they go bankrupt, they go under, they don't have the money, a bank run happens, right? So let me ask you this, if you're picking, which one would you rather be? Okay, if you're currently just the depositor and you've just learned what we talked about today, do you wanna be the depositor still? Or do you wanna be the banker? Okay, or the borrower or the shareholder, right? There's the depositor, there's the banker, there's the borrower. This guy, he still gets to borrow the money and use it to do smart things. I know some real estate investors that do borrow money and they make great money off of those loans because they know how to invest, right? There's shareholders that own the bank. They make dividends every year off of the profit of the bank. What if you could be all four? By changing one thing in your life, which is the location you put your money, where you put your money, you still are a depositor. Okay, the minimum deposit on, on a life insurance contract is going to be anywhere from 2 to 3.25%, depending on the company. That's the guaranteed minimum. Contractually, that's the guaranteed interest rate, right? So you can be a depositor. And let me ask you this, is 2 to 3.25% tax-free, protected from creditors, protected from lawsuits, you get a tax-free death benefit. Is that not better than your current deposit situation? Okay, and then what about being the bank where you can borrow against your deposit? Your net cost of interest can be 1% to 3%. Right? Banks pay interest to borrow. So when people are like, well, I don't want to borrow against my own money. Well, we're trying to be the bank. The bank pays you interest on your deposit. That means the bank is apparently okay paying interest to borrow against money. Right? You're the depositor. When you're the banker, that's not your own money. You have to change the hat. You have to now think as the banker. That's not my own money. That's not Jerry fed his own money. That's not the banker's own money. Jerry, the consumer, deposited his income. That's different than Jerry, the banker. I can't be both. I've got to take the, the, the consumer hat off and put on the banker hat. And now I have to think like a banker. And this is where financial education comes in. How do you think like a banker? Well, a banker thinks, okay, I've got this money growing here. My cost to borrow is one to three. So whatever I'm going to loan it out for or invest for it needs to be greater than one to 3%. So if I'm borrowing, you know, I'm now the borrower too. 
I was the depositor. I put the money into my bank. I changed my hat. I'm now the banker. The banker borrows against the deposit and extends a loan to someone. Who are they loaning it to? Well, now I put on the hat of the borrower. I get to be the borrower as well. I'm going to borrow the money. I'm going to do things like I'm going to pay off debt. Okay, I'm going to make large purchases. I'm going to invest, right? Whatever it is I'm doing. And then I'm going to take the money that I make from that acquisition or the debt pay down or the investment. And as a borrower, I'm going to pay my bank back. I have to be an honest borrower. As a banker, I'm not going to allow someone not to pay my bank back. I would never extend a loan to, to someone else and be like, hey, it's cool if you don't pay me. I was talking to someone the other day and they were like, so do I get to borrow and never pay back? And I told them technically, yeah, you can. The insurance company never requires you to pay back loans. That's the insurance company, right? Doesn't mean that you shouldn't require. The insurance company doesn't care if your bank is profitable. Their job is to facilitate the product that happens to work for this so that you can use it. Just like a car manufacturer, do you think Ford cares if you make your car look ugly after you buy it from them? No. Do you think they care if you wreck it? No. They already sold you a Ford. Your job is to maintain your vehicle. Just like with a bank, your job as the banker is to make sure that you're being an honest banker and you're being paid back every month and that you're being a borrower, you're being an honest borrower and you're being paid back every month. Now, the great thing is you're also now getting dividends. You're a shareholder in the insurance company, right? Just like a shareholder in the bank. So when they earn dividends, the surplus here is going to be paid to you, right? And so the dividend is typically going to be, you know, usually two to 3% in addition to the interest rate. This is also tax-free, right? So when you look at, you know, the bank, look at the bank, like just what we talked about with the bank, you're better than the bank here. If you use this concept, the bank just gets to be the bank. Does the bank also get to be the borrower? Like, are they loaning it to themselves for real estate investing or, or a mortgage? No, they're loaning it to someone else. Do they also get to be the depositor where they're earning the guaranteed interest on your deposit? No, they actually have to pay that. Do they also get to be the shareholder? Usually not. The shareholders are different than the bankers. Here, you get to be all four. This is actually a better setup than the bank even has, right? Now, the final thing I want to hit with this, I'm not going to dive too much into the math and, and nitty gritty today, is I want to talk about what the bank does with their profit. Right, because we said that when you do this, uh, this um, banking, when you're not the bank, you're paying someone else, right? You're paying someone else's bank. They're making profit, right? And what are they doing with that profit? They're putting it in life insurance. You deposit money in the bank. The bank borrows against your deposit. They pay you little to nothing. They put your money at risk. They loan that money out. They invest that money, and then when they make profit. They're the number one owner and purchaser of high early cash value whole life insurance on the planet. Bank of America has $22 billion. Wells Fargo has $19 billion. JP Morgan has $11.2 billion. Just the top 10 banks in the United States have $82.7 billion in life insurance cash value, the exact kind we're telling you about today. You can fact check me on this. Go Google bank-owned life insurance you will see these numbers coming up. And that's just the top 10 banks, guys. This isn't even like everyone. This is just the top 10. And this is since 2018. This is outdated. That's five years old. Since 2014, they've increased their life insurance holdings by 400%. Do you think banks are dumb? I don't. I think what they're doing is working and that's why they, they make so much money. So then why on earth are they putting their money and life insurance policies at this level. This isn't even just like some money, guys. This is what's known as tier one capital. Tier one capital is the most prized reserves that a bank has. It's like your emergency fund. It's the money that you don't touch no matter what. That's the money that they're putting in life insurance. That's their profit first. They're taking the money off the top from their profit, putting it in life insurance first, right? Who else uses this? Because some of you guys might be watching and you're like, oh, my brother-in-law or Dave Ramsey or whoever said not to. Okay. So over 3000 banks in the United States use this concept. They've got over $200 billion collectively in life insurance cash value. They're the number one buyer and owner of it. Joe Biden, President Joe Biden owns six of them. JC Penney used this concept. Walt Disney used this concept. Ray Kroc used this concept. Foster Farms, Stanford University, John Rockefeller, Senator John McCain, Pampered Chef, Waka Flock of Flame, the rapper, President Theodore Roosevelt, Sam Walton, and the Walmart Corporation. Okay, I just found about, out about another one this past week. Back in the late 90s, 
or sorry, the early 90s during the OJ Simpson trial, right? There was a, a moment where the family that was, you know, they, they thought that OJ was guilty and they, they wanted to get financial renew, remuneration from him. They were going to sue him and they couldn't. They couldn't touch his assets. And the reason why is because OJ Simpson had his money in life insurance. Life insurance is protected from lawsuits. So they couldn't touch his assets. Now, whether you thought OJ was guilty or not, the point of the matter is that was a very public trial. Everyone in the nation, even to this day in 2020, John Travolta came out with a documentary show about it. Like that's how, that's how big that trial was. So something from that magnitude and they couldn't pierce the veil of the life insurance, right? That's how protected this is, okay? So guys, the point of today is this is how the top 1% view, view life insurance. They don't view it as a death benefit. We didn't really even talk about the death benefit today. They view it as a wealth building tool and they're currently using it. And the banking quadrant is happening in your bank with your money right now. It's occurring at this moment. While you're on the call today, if you've got money in the bank, it's being loaned out to some random dude on a car and you're not gonna get a dime from that. And you could be using the sacred account and being your own bank instead. And the banks are going to do the life insurance, whether you do or don't. So let me ask you this. What are the alternatives? And, and this is a quote I just want to hit really quick. The problem in America isn't so much what people don't know. It's what people think they know, what people think they know that just ain't so. And today we brought, we broke into probably some things you thought you knew. That it turns out they're not true. And there's two types of individuals out there. There's those that when they see that their reality isn't true, they're willing to change their reality to what is because they want to get results. And then there are those that have fear or, or they've got, you know, some sort of, of inability to con confront the truth. And so they don't like the idea that their reality has been challenged. And instead, they're going to sweep it under the rug and pretend it didn't happen and continue to live life with what's more comfortable because they want to avoid change. And I really hope for your own sake, and I hope for the sake of your family, for your future, for your financial freedom, that you're the first person. You're the one that's willing to say, this makes sense, and it maybe disagrees with what I thought before, but I'm not stuck on my, my, my thoughts. I can change with what works. I can change with where the evidence is, right? Or you could keep giving money to banks. They're going to keep putting your money in there, paying you little to nothing per year and paying, putting your money at risk. They're not going to stop you from that. They're not going to say, whoa, 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 no, Brie, we don't want your money. Now you know you can be your own bank. Go do that instead. Did you guys know banks have life insurance licenses? They could be selling you this. They don't. March into a bank right now and tell them you want a life insurance policy. They're going to sell you some shitty ass life insurance policy, some accidental death policy. If you cut off your left arm on a Tuesday and it's cloudy, they'll pay you some extra money. They're not going to give you a sacred account. They're not going to talk to you about the concept, yet their profits are going into that very thing. Or you can keep putting money in the retirement account. And you can have fun with your three loaves of, of stale bread and your chunky milk in 30 years. Or there's cash, right? It's going to continue going down in value. You're going to continue to buy less and less and less every year, right? So guys, what I want to do is I'm going to turn this back over to Bree. I have to jump on a, on a podcast interview, but... I'm going to leave Bree in charge of the, um, the rest of the webinar today. So if you're on, a couple things. Number one, if you're on today, you get a free arena bootcamp ticket. Don't forget that. Martin is going to get you set up with that. Number two, if you've not yet gotten a copy of my book, Blueprint to Financial Freedom, okay? I'm going to have Martin drop that in the chat. That's jerryfeta.com forward slash B2F program or promo, okay, B2F promo. And then third is we're doing a free wealth potential analysis. So, um, you know, Brie can talk a little bit about that. Um, anyone on the call here is qualified for that. Whether you're a client or not, we want to do a wealth potential analysis with you and go over your results. So, Brie, I'm going to turn this back over to you. Um, thank you guys for all tuning in this weekend, by the way. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jerry. Great having you. Awesome. Thanks, Brie. I'm going to go ahead and turn this over and uh, uh, we'll talk later. All right. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and get some stuff pulled up, but I do want to go back to this and add right quick. So I'm huge on statistics because, you know, there's nothing like being able to see from a good range of data what's going on in everyone's lives. And the point is that 80% of Americans are paycheck to paycheck. Of those 80%, 
about 8% of them are six figure earners. So that means it's not a lack of money. Money is abundant. It is a lack of knowing what to do with it. And out of uh, the American population, 60% of Americans don't even have a thousand dollars in savings. So when I tell you that it is just one difference, the fact that I could go from 14 years of paycheck to paycheck behavior and using a poverty level income of 2000, get myself out of debt and out of paycheck to paycheck in eight months, I'm out of that 80% of statistics. I'm no longer paycheck to paycheck. I'm not one of the 60% of people that doesn't have $1,000 to my name. And it all happened within a year time frame of just putting my money in my own bank. So it really, really does work. And I'm also going to share my screen here. Go right back to this. We know we can't trust the banks, right? We already know with them not having to keep your money in your account like that, it's just not a smart choice with knowing how many banks have failed, but also just the lack of protections is a really, really concerning thing. Uh, also with our retirement accounts, thinking about how everyone is putting in all this money and we're recommended to, guys, retirement accounts didn't come out until 1974. All right, the traditional IRA came out in 1974. The 401k, uh, 401k came out in uh, 1979. Let me go ahead and pull up a little picture here that actually shows how it looks. 78, I'm sorry, 401k came out in 78. And the Roth IRA came out in 1997. That means we haven't even seen a full generation of people pay into their retirement accounts and retire off of them. Think about all of the older people you've probably seen working jobs. I'm not counting Congress, but think of all the people that are in retirement age that you see still out there working because they don't have the retirement money to go live comfortably because these accounts are not working. They're just great for giving the modern banking system that we've had since 1913, the ability to keep using our money to go and make that 400 to 1300% profit. That's all they want. They want control of your money in their own banks so they can go and turn it into more money. Skip that step. Take out the middleman. Do it yourself because it will work in record time. And you have the option of paying back month to month. But to get myself where I was, I was so excited. I was just putting the money right back. I treat it like I can have my dollars go out, buy my hard-earned money, spend my dollar, go buy ice cream or something. And that dollar is gone forever. But I know if that dollar goes through my sacred account first, I can always recycle and recapture it. And that's how we get out of the position we're in and actually break the matrix. That's what we're here to do. And of course, cash, it's just the current form of money, the current form that we've got. It's, it's, our, it's our currency that we're using and it's going to be replaced. That's why we don't want to keep using just the cash. Um, and actually just adding to that, my, my mother-in-law, she had... <laughs> She has uh, four, 4,500 in savings. She has her house paid off, her car paid off. She only has utilities. She's in a really good position on that, but she is in retirement age and her retirement accounts are not performing well. She has one loan that's costing her 500 a month and there's $3,000 left owed on it. By her opening her sacred account and just putting her savings into her account, she can turn around and pay off that loan, save herself that 500 a month. She also just found out she can put an extra 14,000 from her retirement account into the sacred account. So even someone that's in that retirement age understands the value of this and they all wish they could have done, done it sooner. So to do this, if you guys are wanting to go and be like, I'm ready, I wanna get my own bank started. There's two different kinds of banks. We have the sacred account light, which this one is what I currently have. This is designed to help you get rid of that consumer debt get your toes wet and get a feel for actually being your own bank. You're only doing a seven to 10 year contribution period. After that, you can continue watching the money grow, watch the dividends keep coming in, the compound interest keep working and keep borrowing against the funds. You're just not adding new premium payments into the account after that seven to 10 years. And it's actually going to be just the 10 to 15 times your age per month. That's your minimum that you do. When I opened my sacred account on March 8th of last year, my premium was $250 a month. And I borrowed against my sacred account March 11th, three days into having a life insurance policy. And I took a loan against it for my first premium. And I paid off a credit card. 
I paid it right back at the beginning of April. And I just kept rinsing and repeating that. And that's how I got out of paycheck to paycheck. That's how I pay down all that debt in eight months. And I've seen clients do it in uh, like six figure amounts. I had 150,000 in about a year uh, and six months was the record for that, that I've seen personally. So this really works regardless where your income is sitting at. You could have been at poverty levels like I had been, or you could be doing pretty well for yourself and you're just still not able to break that barrier and get to that accredited investor status. Whatever it is, being your own bank is going to help you get there. We've seen how much profit there is for the banks to do it. Those are one of the systems we want to try and replicate and follow. You can do it. There's also the sacred account premium. The premium, this one's mil uh, actually built for the long-term reserves. This is what we're going to be looking for to borrow against for investing purposes. So there's going to be more overall growth on that type of account. And these, you're going to be getting to do a contribution up to the age of 65. And just like Joe Biden has six sacred accounts himself, you're not limited by how many you can have. We want to put as much of our own money into our own bank as we can. Opening up another sacred account is like opening up a second location for, or a second branch for your bank. And either one that you get is going to come with the access to the Wealth Dynamics University. The light gives you six months of access and the premium gives you an entire year. And we have hundreds of courses and videos for you to go through on all kinds of topics, ranging from economics, bullion, credit, debt, all of it is in there, even talking about the sacred account. And we're going to send you six books in the mail. And you're also going to be getting blueprint phase reviews. This is the benefit of having a team here helping you with your finances. It's not just you all alone anymore. You have a professional team that's there to actually go through and look with you at how your construction is going for your blueprint. Is it lining up? Are you building the house correctly? Did you start with the roof and now you're trying to do the foundation? That's not in line with our blueprint. We can help and people having this blueprint is actually what's gonna change things. Most don't use this. So if you guys already have an account, uh, you're always welcome to sign up for another. Like I said, if you don't and you still just want to see how would this look for you, I even sometimes share what my personal sacred account looks like. I will sign in and show how that's been doing for a year's performance. Um, you guys can get scheduled with us on a Zoom or on a call. All right, we can go ahead and go through it. Uh, Martin, if you could, would you please post the uh, my calendar link into the chat just so I don't have to change screens? Now, after you and I get to do a meeting and we go through everything, make sense of the numbers, make sense of the information, and you say, yes, I'm on board, let's do this, we do the sign up, and you're going to get to watch the Money Multiplier Masterclass video, all right? That's the agency that I told you, they're, they're doing hundreds of sacred accounts each month. They help with our fulfillment. They're really good at their jobs. You're also going to get an onboarding uh, call with our team, and that's going to be a chance to actually see where are you sitting at on the blueprint. So where do we need to be prioritizing putting our sacred account funds to get ourselves to the next phase? And then you're going to get to do your application with our money multiplier team. You're going to have to go through your medical and financial review for approval. Uh, and that can take several weeks. So the average length of time between when you sign up and actually do the application and get the account is about four to six weeks. So that gives you a chance to start trying to be like, okay, I'm going to take stock and work on some good habits here. That's what I did. I realized I am too broke to afford my monthly premium of $250 a month where I was. So what I did was I stopped going out for coffee. I made a sacrifice for my financial future. I took account for Alaska. We have a lot of coffee huts here, a uh, crazy amount of coffee huts. The coffee is not cheap. I was doing about 7 to $10 a day, and that was at least five days a week. And that added up to about 200 plus a month for me. That was my sacred account premium. I gave up that one little thing just for a bit so that I could get my finances in order. And it worked within those eight months and I haven't had to look back. And now I can go get myself coffee and not feel bad about it. Um, so that's a good chance for you guys to see and challenge yourself. I have four to six weeks before I fund my sacred account. How fiscally responsible can I be for the next month to month and a half and how much can I save up to dump into my sacred account when it's ready to fund? How much can I put into capital to get my bank rolling? And then you're going to get a review with your account too. Right before you actually fund it, the delivery team is going to meet with you. And we're going to go over all the aspects of it to make sure this is 
this is it. This is the right one because these aren't cookie cutter accounts. They're actually custom designed and it takes our entire mapping team to make sure that you get the type of bank designed for your goals and intentions. And then you get approved, you fund your account and begin using your account. That's really the beauty of how it works. Um, I don't know if we have any questions here. I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment and check for any questions. I'm not seeing any, so let's go through. Uh, yes, uh, Martin, I can definitely help with that. And I, I believe everyone should read the Blueprint book. That is a highly, highly recommended book because it. I've heard a lot of people say that they've heard of some of the concepts, but they've never seen them all in tune together. That's really what it is. We go through life and we're getting snippets and pieces of things that work or don't work. And we're Frankensteining together a life plan. And then we wonder why we're struggling or having difficulties. This is what it takes. It takes actually following a proven system, one that we've seen the wealthiest people through history for over a century use. And that's where Jerry got the blueprint. He did not make it up. He studied the rich dead white guys that have been around for over a hundred years. And he observed to the point you could almost highlight it in their biographies. This is what they did to get their wealth. And this is how they kept their wealth growing even after they died. And that's what we're here to do. We're here to create generational wealth for our kids, uh, for the communities, because everyone that gets to win together, they're gonna be able to make changes together. So Gary, for premiums, premiums are actually calculated by uh, based off of your age or what you request to set up. So if you're doing a dump in amount, it's going to be a percentage of whatever lump sum you put in when you start the account, or you can have it set up off your age. So. Um, like my husband's 44, his premium is 440 a month, 10 times the age. Uh, someone's, oh, you're welcome. I'm going through all the comments here and seeing if there's any other questions. Okay, and yes, Martin did put my booking link in the chat. So if anyone wants to talk about this, if anyone wants to see what my sacred account that's like a year and a half old looks like, uh, we could definitely hop on a call or go on a Zoom. Awesome. Okay, not seeing too many questions here. Ian had to hop off. Great. Well, that's, if I don't have any questions, we're going to go ahead and uh, end the presentation here. I just want to make sure that everyone's gotten in touch with Martin or with myself. Okay. And if you guys do want that wealth potential analysis, go ahead and put in the chat wealth potential analysis. Just put that there. Martin and I will take note of your names and I will send you the link and we'll go ahead and schedule a meeting if we need to. I believe I actually had the link here. Let me try and see if I could put it back in. But if you go through and yes, I do. If you go through and do this wealth potential analysis, you're gonna go ahead and do a meeting with me after and we'll go through your graph together. What's really cool about that is it tells us where we actually need to focus energy on. Obviously, there's a lot of different steps when it comes to finances, and it's like a juggling act, but doing that analysis, giving yourself a chance to talk to yourself about it and answer those questions, you're going to be able to know which ball you actually need to catch first, which one's at risk of rolling away. That's really what that analysis is for. So I highly recommend everyone get a chance to do it. Okay, great. Good to hear, Mark. Now, does anyone else have any more questions before we end out today's webinar? Or comments, it could be anything. All right. Ooh. Okay, guys, I'm gonna go ahead and end the meeting here. I do wanna say thank you so much for coming on a Saturday. I know it's a holiday weekend. But being able to dedicate to yourself that time just to prioritize thinking about money and finances and learning, you're going to be putting yourselves in a much better position for the future.
That's that's a good option. Yes. You can always do sacred accounts for people that you have a, a insurable interest with. Thank you, Lawrence. Nice to see you again. <laughs> Yeah, even if the sacred account isn't an option for right now, put your retirement accounts to use. If you have retirement accounts, roll those babies over to a self-directed option. When they're self-directed, you can choose where the investments are going if you still want to play the Wall Street game. I don't recommend it. Or you could be putting your retirement plan to be owning for real estate and gold and leasing out the gold. You can be making passive income from your real, uh, retirement plan and be in charge of it. And that's going to be saving you that 1% average management wealth fee. We don't want that. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, great. Thank you, Gary. You have a great weekend too. Awesome, guys. We'll see you next week, okay? Don't forget, we have the uh, live June 3rd event. So if you guys are going to want to attend that, keep an eye out in your email and check out our Facebook group. I'll see you June 3rd. Happy Memorial Day. <laughs> Good weekend, everyone.